Okay, we will now switch to German. We would like to thank the interpreters already now because they will be quite busy here. I would now like to ask three panelists to come up on stage. We are going further later. We will sort of proliferate, but we will start with three panelists. Peter Dombrovsky. I will introduce them later. Marcel Dico and Yabin Liang. Because we would now like to test and find out what strategic changes there are. So the question is, what are strategic changes and backdrops that lead to the use of drones? It goes without saying that we will also shed some light on technologies and ethical questions, but we would like to start in that rather small round here. And of course, we will also give the audience the opportunity to ask questions, because you should not only just sit here and listen, but you should also get involved. Okay, I would like to ask the three gentlemen to join me here on stage. Where is Mr. Dico? Oh, he's here. Okay, so here are your nameplates. Okay, great to have you here. We need a headset. We need low tech here on stage for interpretation. Okay, to my left, I would like to welcome Dr. Yabin Liang of the Institute for International and Strategic Studies of the Party School of the Central Committee of the CPC in Beijing. So we have planners here on stage, as you can see. Then we have Professor. Dombrovsky. He is the chair of the Strategic Research Department in the U.S. Naval War College in Newport. By the way, we also have comprehensive CVs for all of you because we don't want to spend too much time on introducing our panelists. Dr. Marcel Dicko of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, who also deals with security issues and strategy issues. We sort of borrow, or you are lent to the Bucks, the Federal Academy for Security in Germany, here in Berlin. Now, I would like to pose one question to the three of you, and I think we should start with Mr. Liang. Now, what strategic targets are there when it comes to using drones? And what are the strategic targets that you can probably better achieve with drones. Liang, maybe you can start. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, actually, in China, we really have developed some uh, high tech, uh, such like uh, unmanned drone. And uh, you may be seeing the newspaper about the WJ-600 is a stealth drone. And uh, now in China, the, the main target of this drone is collecting intelligence, uh, something maybe we, in other words, call it reconnaissance uh, surveillance, something like that. And uh, we know that in the United States, they have exercised a lot of uh, strikes, drone strike in Pakistan and uh, other areas. But uh, now in China, it's not uh, our main idea. Usually the drone uh, can be used in military use, but uh, now we should, in China, we spend so much money on this thing. We cannot, we don't want to fight a war, use it. Usually we use it to surveillance our agriculture, harvest the thing. And uh, 
uh, earthquake uh, surveilling, something like that. Also, wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, geht das hier. So, if I understand you correctly, it is mainly about the civil use of drones. But China, as far as I know, is also one of those countries that have drones that are armed. Sure, that's true. We have this program and we have a lot of drones armed in our army. But actually, like any, like lots of other uh, high tech weapons, we have this technology. But we, c we cannot afford to fulfill equipment in all our army. We, maybe we have the largest army in the world, about two million, more than two million uh, soldiers. But we have limited, uh, uh, we have limited energy and uh, money to support so much high-tech uh, equipment. So we have this the technology and the equipment, but it's only equipped in a very small group. Afford, verstehe ich das richtig? Aha, so you have limited financial funds, if I get it right. No. Um, well, yeah, but it is an investment, or, it, or you invest in armed drones, even if you have limited financial funds. So the question is, what would be possible or potential scenarios for China? Because China for years has claimed that it wants to rise hum in harmony, sort of. So what would be the scenarios for China to feel good to also use armed drones. So what type of conflict would that be? I, I, would, like, I would not like to use the word China is rising up. We just uh, become, maybe to a certain extent, we become more richer and more, we have more uh, influence than before. But actually, if you, we compare China and the other countries, especially the Western advanced countries, developed countries, we really have a long way to go. And uh, on the high tech, especially on the drone uh, development, and uh, that's very clear that we have a very big gap between China and the uh, developed countries. So our strategic uh, aim is to, how to say, to detained something like that to, to make it a, a certain balance. We have this technology. You should not look down upon us. Okay, ich komme dann nachher noch mal auf die Frage zurück. I will come back to the question of what scenarios there might be when it comes to the use of armed drones in China. But maybe I should continue with you, Mr. Dombrovsky. The United States uses drones in all kinds of different situations in Afghanistan, that is in the context of a non-international armed conflict, but also in Pakistan or Yemen. Now, let us come back to the question that Ralph Fuchs raised earlier. Is it true that drones really make the militarization of conflicts easier? If we have a look at Pakistan, they are used where soldiers never get to, I mean, the collateral damage that might be triggered is very difficult to assess later on, very difficult to understand. So very difficult to make an assessment of the collateral damage later. So what are the strategic advantages when it comes to the use of drones? Um, thank you for the question. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a private citizen rather than the U.S. government, so please take my remarks as such. Um, I think, you know, in, in some ways the question the focus on drain, drones is a bit misleading um, because you really need to think about drones in the context of, in a wider context. Um, drones are simply one tool amongst many uh, that we use in warfare, whether it's, you know, armed aircraft or artillery or missiles or tanks, or all the things we're familiar with from the movies and from our own reading and analysis. And to isolate drones from, from that wider context uh, misunderstands the problem, in fact, probably frightens us more in some ways than is necessary. And, and that's not because uh, the, uh, the drone strikes are not... Uh, dangerous. They are not. They do not kill people. It's because it's part and parcel of a larger system. Um, 
you, you need to think about this. You know, these are the, the, the warfare we undertake and how we do it are a set of choices. And we choose these things as, at least in the American case and in the Western European case, and certainly a German case, uh, as part of a democratic political process. And that democratic political process leads us in particular directions. Um, the, the drone is a tool. It's a prominent tool. It's got a lot of press. Uh, it's been in the war on terror and the counterinsurgency uh, operations in Afghanistan played a, a prominent role. But to focus there is in some ways misleading because it's still a relatively modest portion of military budgets. It's still a modest portion of firepower that we have in your military and my and our military and the combined NATO operations. So I, I would just like to encourage us to think about it in a broader context. It's a tool. It's a tool controlled by men, by laws, by systems, and by institutions. Uh, particular uses, again, controlled by men. Then let us just talk about nicht nur über okay, so let us not only talk about the military means, but also about the place and places where they are used. Amongst international lawyers, there is a hot debate as to whether they can be used because they are a military means. We also have seen that they can be proliferated in the civil area. So if they are used in Pakistan or Yemen, is that a military means which is used in a non-war area? Do you see a problem there? If the question's to me, I, I will be very careful because you, you need to think about uh, some fairly specific things about where the strikes, uh, where the strikes are taking place, uh, who's undertaking the strike, uh, and under what circumstances. So it's relatively uncontroversial, at least amongst the military and the national security community, to use uh, uh, drones uh, to protect soldiers in the ground. Uh, to use drones to attack a terrorist, a potential terrorist, depending on where they are under what circumstances, can be quite controversial. Who is actually running the drone, who is actually operating it, matters. And, and the legalities differ from case to case. Uh, in the United States, um, it's been a matter of uh, quite a bit of debate. Uh, it's still a matter of debate. The president has weighed in, but that's not the final word. Congress is getting involved. Um, I'd simply suggest uh, that, you know, when we think about drone sites, we need to disaggregate them a bit. Uh, if soldiers in a battle are protected by a drone, that seems fairly reasonable. If soldiers, uh, excuse me, if drone attacks are made, uh, the so-called signature drone strikes, for example, in an area that's not in the battle space, uh, this is open to uh, question. But we, we just have to be careful to look at the specifics of the case rather than the disaggregated uh, drone. Okay, so let me become a little more specific because this is exactly what we want to do here. And this is also something that the public in Germany, in Pakistan, in the US and also other countries is interested in. And this has, of course, an impact on the drone debate. So once drones are used in the so-called war against terror, they are used in places where there is no armed conflict taking place, according to international law. If I overdo it a little bit, then I can also use an F-16 and use it in Düsseldorf in order to fight against a terrorist cell here in Germany. They would think that this is crazy and not justified. So a very clear question. Can, according to your view, drones be used? I mean, and it doesn't matter whether it is aircraft or drones. Can they be used in a non-war or non-conflict area with the pretext of war against terror? question that the international lawyers in the room, and I think there's a panel coming up tomorrow where there's a, a bunch of people that are, that are lawyers. I'm sure you have an opinion on that. It is your private opinion. It's fine. I will answer that I believe, as I said in an earlier response, that in a democratic society, even when mistakes are made or different disagreements take place about the use of a military system or, or an intelligence technology uh, uh, come to the forefront, that we have to be confident that our elected representatives, both in the executive branch and in the legislative branch in parliament, uh, will uh, take steps within the law, within the court system, within international law, uh, to rectify 
uh, things that we may uh, disagree with. The political process will take care of that. Okay. We will keep that question for later. Obviously, we have two questions that are still open, and we can maybe also discuss the questions with the audience later. So, first question was, what are potential scenarios for China regarding armed drone use? And then second question, when it comes to issues of international law, this is, is that really a question that requires political initiatives? This is definitely something that is part of this conference. Now, Mr. Dicko, a very simple question. Why does Germany need drones? It's the first time that I need to use a disclaimer here. Yeah, you can do that. Very simple. I am here as a scientist of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. I have been lent to the Bucks that is the Federal Agency for Security, and it has nothing to do with it now, that is okay. So I feel as a scientist here. Now, why does the German army need drones, was the question. First of all, for reconnaissance purposes. And this is the official position of the Ministry of Defense, and it's also the position of the federal government. It needs it in order to do something which is called close air support. That is air support in an operation scenario that we have in Afghanistan. And the idea is that you can observe, monitor, and act at the same time. When it comes to the drones used, Heron 1, they are not armed. They can monitor if there is, for instance, suddenly an attack, but they cannot interfere. Then they have to ask for air support. That needs some time, maybe 30 minutes, sometimes even longer. So you depend on a friendly nation providing that air support. That would not be the case with an armed drone. So this is sort of the official position why the Federal Army wants drones. What is the unofficial version? My unofficial interpretation is that this is really the case. However, I have the feeling that this is a discussion which is clearly referred to the Afghanistan scenario, which is a very specific scenario on the one hand. On the other hand, it is a scenario which shows that at the end of 2014, the German army will withdraw, at least with its combat forces, and now people would have to discuss the general scenarios regarding the use of armed drones. Okay, let's focus on unmanned aerial systems for a minute because they are sort of the bigger problem. This is what we want to discuss here. You mentioned it already. You mentioned the Afghanistan scenario already. In terms of international law, there is no problem because, of course, it is a non-international armed conflict, so those means can be used, provided that the military forces and management consider this the right tactical means. Guido de Ratefox would have said that this is probably the right assumption. But the Afghanistan scenario is a specific scenario because we have a mandate for this conflict especially when it comes to the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. Can you imagine scenarios where the German army could say it would be good if we had that means because it might be possible that we have further operations and missions in which we might use unmanned armed aerial systems? I cannot really think what this could look like, because the war on terror is not a war that Germany participates in, but what could be a potential scenario that might emerge one day? Well, all scenarios that have an asymmetrical character would qualify here. There are certain technical requirements as to how those drones can be used at current. Imagine a drone like the Heron 1 
in principle, is a load motorized flyer, very slow, very can be attacked easily, especially when landing and departing. So the systems that we have at the moment can only be used if the airspace is blocked and under your own military control. And this only affects to those asymmetric scenarios where you have a clearly stronger army in terms of technology that fights against an uprising or surgeons insurgents. Yeah, but the German army would only get involved if it had a mandate. So we are not talking about simple asymmetric wars, but they would have to have a mandate for that operation anyways. Yes, that's true. Now, let me come back to the question that I asked to Peter Dombrovsky. So the possibility of the militarization of the conflict we are talking about bigger technological possibilities because the nature of war is always that that soldiers have to be protected while enemies have to be crushed if possible. So the goal of the war is to achieve technical asymmetry. This is sort of a tactical goal, I would say. But can it be that conflicts and this is also a question to you, Mr. Dicko, that conflicts will be militarized more because we have technologies available that protect soldiers much better. So they don't send the soldiers to the front line. They can be remotely controlled. Let's take the example of Pakistan because you can access remote control, uh, remote areas that you would usually not access with your groups on the ground for good reasons, for political reasons, etc. Do you see that, that risk? I think you are raising an important subject here. If you have a look at the militaries of this world and talk to them, then you see that there's a certain enthusiasm for drones, but not too big an enthusiasm. It is an effective means, they say, but they don't say that this is going to be a revolution. I think we would rather have and see a political revolution. The commander on the ground is happy that he has those reconnaissance possibilities, that he can use a weapon because he has it faster available and he can find, fix, and act. But the point is that it will make change happen in politics. The drone war of the CIA in Pakistan clearly shows that. I can't imagine that the American Air Force would do the same with F-16 like the CIA is doing in Pakistan at the moment. Having said that, apart from tactical operative levels where you have a bigger role for robotics systems, the political level when it comes to armed drones is what is decisive. And here I see certain changes because the first argument when it comes to the use of drones is always the same. People say that they want to protect the lives of their own soldiers. And this is clearly a political argument. This is an argument that clearly focuses on your own country, on your own population. I mean, militaries have the task to wage war. And per definition, they accept that there are victims and casualties. It is a military, and it's not a police force. And I think this is the crux. Mr. Dombrovsky, the question goes back to you. Is that a problem anyway, that it's not the military, but it's intelligence services and the CIA that pursue activities with drones. And as far as I know, President Obama announced that he wanted to restrict this a little bit. But is that in itself problematic that actions are launched by the intelligence services that are actually limited to the military? To, to begin with your initial question, I think it's worth revisiting what you asked, uh, uh, Mr. Dickow. Um, First of all, it's unclear that these new systems will lead to the militarization of conflict any more uh, than any other system um, because the use of force and the potential 
uh, for killing and being killed is always a serious uh, situa- is always a serious decision uh, for any government, including my own. Um, so, what's interesting about drones is they possess some tactical and operational advantages that other situ- systems don't. Um, so, for example, you could use uh, missiles uh, to attack uh, bad guys, if you want to call them that, in any particular place at any particular time. Uh, and they're quite accurate today, and uh, they're quite devastatingly uh, effective. Um, but a missile has uh, takes some time uh, to be launched. The, uh, the distance between the missile and the target oftentimes uh, means that uh, the bad guys move. Um, the drone, for example, can linger and watch and study and record and uh, make sure that uh, maybe good guys get away from the bad guys or aren't around at the time the strike is made. So at least in theory, uh, the drone offers some tactical advantages over using other kinds of remote systems, manned or unmanned. And uh, I think that's the relevant issue with drones more than militarization of conflict in general. Conflict is is militarized uh, for other purposes, and drones may contribute to how that operation is carried out, but not to the actual militarization per se, in my opinion. The tactical advantage of drones is what I can understand, but still I'm re-asking this question. I'm sorry for insisting that much. Could the U.S.? have waged war against the Taliban or terrorists in an area like Pakistan and remote areas like North Waziristan and others, uh, geographically remote areas, if it hadn't been for the drones? I mean, of course, you can also enter with an F-16, but, I mean, it is easier with a drone because it gives you more pictures, more reconnaissance material, and you can enter territories that and I'm repeating this, that are not conflict areas and for which, in military terms, there is no mandate for operations of any kind. And in that particular case, similar thing goes for Yemen, hasn't technology helped here for military actions to happen more easily, to be conducted more easily, and also in a more hidden way, because the F-16 would be rather large, as if we hadn't disposed of this technology of the drones with all its reconnaissance options and options of use? Um, My simple answer is I think uh, if the political and military choice had been made to prosecute uh, a war or counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, the Philippines, or any other country out there, uh, the possibility remained regardless of whether drones were used or not. There are other military systems that could have been used, including boots on the ground, as they say. Uh, The drone is a particular technique and a particular instrument. Uh, If the political will had been there and the need was foreseen, I suspect uh, you would have seen other kinds of systems used. So, for example, everybody has seen the movie about the Bin Laden raid. Uh, If you remember the movie and the books and the stories uh, that have looked into it, there was lots of different options for actually going after Bin Laden, including a missile strike. Uh, including using uh, fast burners, as they say, uh, to to attack a target. The choice was made for tactical reasons, for political reasons, uh, to use boots on the ground, but it could have been done in various other ways, including using drones. So I I think you have to understand that there are – that drones are a tool, one amongst many tools. It does allow certain kinds of things to be done more effectively uh, than other kinds of systems – but I don't think they're so unique uh, that they're worthy of uh, uh, the charge that they are responsible for the militarization of conflict by the United States or any other, any other country. Okay. Mr. Liang, because I said that I wouldn't spare you the question, I'd like to get back to my initial question and ask you again. Strategically thinking, what would be decisive scenarios for China in which China would resort to this type of military technique, i.e. unmanned drones, and later on we're going back to late to cyber war? So what could be potential scenarios in which the use of um, armed drones might be plausible for China because you have them and they are expensive? 
that's really a difficult question for me. And I think China's uh, high tech, high technology. Usually, maybe you think we have a lot of copies from your technologies. Actually, uh, China is a developing country. We tried our best uh, to learn and uh, to to uh, in in the world we call it world engineering, something like that, to develop our military weapon systems. And uh, those systems uh, we learn a lot from. Russia and even from the United States, and uh, strategically, we use these weapons. Usually, we use these weapons to just uh, to detain, to, to use uh, like a, a balance. You you mentioned that China uh, peacefully rising up. Actually, we call it a peaceful development, and uh, we and. Germany and other countries can develop those country those weapons. Of course, we have the right to develop our weapons, and uh, we we that does not mean we will use it to against uh, a certain country or certain person. At least uh, we have never used uh, these uh, systems, and we the United States is the first country to use these weapons to strike a certain person. And maybe in the future, we will use it. On what aspect? I personally think maybe to use it to strike terrorists. Terrorists uh, will also suffer a lot of terrorist attack in China, especially in some sensitive areas. And uh, maybe we have different understanding about those people. Um, at least we have, when, uh, we have not used it. Maybe in the future. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't often see the enemy can say. Well, we can't be sure. Omid no report. Will you join us on stage here, please? We're enlarging the panel a little bit. And as we've been talking about scenarios, I'd like to address the question to you as well. I mean, what are potential scenarios of use for Germany? We have to reiterate that the Greens have bled a lot to come up with a decision to run army operations outside NATO areas. And the Greens have always supported the operations in Afghanistan. And now I'd like to hear from a politician what could be potential scenarios of missions. And the next question, what do we use drones for? And what are tactical and strategic benefits that we can get with the help of drones? Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Should I comment on football as well? No, I don't think so. We've been discussing the question of armed drones for long. I'm only talking about armed drones now, not about reconnaissance drones. And we held party conventions on that topic. And we came to the conclusion that the army of Germany doesn't need any strike drones. And we consider some tactical situations in which we can talk about whether it makes sense and that it might make sense. But the essential issues have not yet been discussed widely enough. And changes that this might bring about and potential risks that this might entail in warfare by way of unmanned systems are quite profound. Let me just draw your attention to one or two aspects that have not been mentioned before. One aspect is that it gets without saying that many uses of um, strike drones are comparable to the use of F-16 fighter planes. But what we need to talk about as well is what the post traumatic syndrome might be to pilots of drones and it's way higher in the nations in which they're used it's way higher for drone pilots than the trauma suffered by fighter plane pilots and um, well because they've got these clear pictures in front of them they see the faces in a much clearer way the faces of persons that they're going to shoot at and this is a story that we can't just push aside what it means to the soldiers let me just pick up on that because often the argument is put forward that killing becomes more well it becomes easier that way and uh, asking that again I mean you can't know it because you're not the one sitting there and deciding upon a chain of 
command and feedback. I mean, it's not an easy decision to just push on a red button. But still, those who are in control of everything are aware of the fact that this is not a video game and that what they're going to do is going to kill a person. Well, this scenario of a father taking the child to the kindergarten and then later on he comes back home, uh, logs himself onto the net and uh, actually a joystick is something that won't happen. But the danger will be a political decision because from the point in time when the Minister of Defence doesn't need to justify that um, coffins will come back, it's of course easier to tell, yes, okay, let's enter. And this is a wider and broader discussion that we need to pursue when talking about the strike drone. Okay, at this point, let me just turn to the audience, whether there are questions from amongst the audience. There are microphones here in the audience. We'd like to get you involved. I've got some microphones here, and let us just pick up on those two questions. Uh, and, and Noel Sharkey, you're going to join us on the panel in a minute as well. But please be brief in your question, and be nice if you directed the question directly to one of the panelists. The first question is comes from the first row, not just because I can see you better, but it was the first hand that was raised. Can you briefly introduce yourself? Vietar, I'm a, a senior counsel with Human Rights First in, based in New York. And my question really is addressing um, Peter Dombros Dombrowski. You talk about the United States and how, because we have a democratic system, this is in the express political, the way that the drone system is operating um, is the express political will of Americans. The problem I have with that is that the, it is operating in such secrecy, whether by the CIA or by the special forces of the, bil the military, that actually the U.S. public is not at all informed about how the drone war works. So doesn't that impact whether there is any actual political accountability or whether there's really even political will, particularly since we're not risking our U.S. troops and the victims of the war are only anonymous people who the U.S. doesn't know about, <clears throat> excuse me, and we don't get any civilian casualty counts. Will you take this question right away? Sure. Yes, I, am, I absolutely agree with the premise of your question. I think that uh, greater transparency, I think that uh, more political attention by the appropriate authorities, particularly in Congress and the court system, is absolutely necessary. Um, so uh, I think your, your question is right. I think, you know, the democratic process is slow and it's painful sometimes and it doesn't necessarily make the right decision in the first instance every time. Uh, and it'll be greatly... Uh, uh, It'd be greatly helped by greater uh, openness on the part of both the Obama administration and past administrations, and I think this is absolutely necessary. But is it only about the speed of the process or also about the openness of the process? Because by definition, some decisions has to be probably taken in a smaller group. But still, you know, having actually a war going on in Pakistan should be should be made a broader decision, and it's not only about the speed of the process, it's about the openness. Um, uh, first of all, let me just be clear. Uh, as far as I understand it, we're not at war with Pakistan. In fact, Pakistan's an American ally. Um, much of what goes on in the border area in the Fatah around uh, Afghanistan uh, is done with the full knowledge of the Pakistani government. Now, the legitimacy of the Pakistani government and their choices are another... Uh, issue entirely. So we're not at war in Pakistan. Uh, there have been military activities. As far as I understand it, most of those military activities have been done with the knowledge and consent of the pa Pakistani government. Darf ich das nochmal festhalten, weil das ein wichtiger Punkt ist? Can I just pick up on that? Many of the things that are going on in Pakistan are done in the knowledge um, of the Pakistani government. Is that right? What do press reports say? Es gibt aber ähm, trotzdem im Völkerrecht nicht. Äh But still, I mean, there is international law, so it's not relevant whether there is intelligence service information ex exchange. The legitimate authorities in Pakistan protest against this, and they say that they don't want any of this. So from the point in time onwards, when there is no official approval by Pakistan, this is a breach of international law because this goes beyond ter territorial sovereignty of the country. But the second point, which is more relevant, is the fact that there was a policy, there used to be a policy to say that once we've identified a terrorist, then all the men in his environment that are adult are terrorists as well. This has got nothing to do with the rule of law, the way I conceive it and the way we conceive it in Europe. But 
there are heaps of studies that demonstrate that this is an acquisition generator for Taliban and other terrorist groups to build up a narrative of David against Goliath, which leads massively to a situation where as these drone strikes exist, they can um, recruit new people. And I think in terms of international law, I think it's nonsense to um, go on like that because then the Hydra is fed even more. But this has got uh, little to do with... um, great uh, use of technologies because these means are available, but this has got something to do with political and international law background and context, and tomorrow there will be an extensive panel on international law issues. But let me add one thing. I do believe that when thinking about it and thinking about introducing new technologies in the 21st century, where there are different technologies of communication, it is indispensable to talk about what it does to communication, how do you explain to people that you use this new technology? How will the public respond? How will the other side respond and deal with it? And of course, in Afghanistan, we have a media battle going on with the Taliban. And the question is, who's the target group? And when neglecting this and when hiding behind my technology, then once again, this leads to the others having an easier time, terrorists having easier time recruiting people. So getting back to what we had before, what are the objectives of my war? How do I explain and justify it? We have two more questions, the lady in the second row in the middle aisle, and then the microphone will be passed on to the gentleman in the green shirt, and then we're going to go on on the panel. The question goes to Mr. Dombrovsky. Can you introduce yourself, please? My name is von Bonnevsky. I believe that the argumentation in the beginning where you said that you were here as a private person is hardly is, is really hardly credible. It's dishonest because you're talking as if you were a diplomat here. There are no clear answers given by you. On the other hand, you explained something which has got nothing to do with human rights but with a hunt for humans. And you can pursue directly where the target is and where they are. This is a hunt for people. This is chasing people. Well, I'm just drawing your attention to the fact that we should stick to the technology here. Yes, but this technology, at the end of the day, will lead to a situation where we can do away with NATO and, you know, the United Nations. Well, can I ask you, because I didn't really get your point, I mean, if you're in a war situation, you you do shoot at a person. Well, but the way you do it with a drone doesn't require any mandate anymore, does it? I mean, let's think of Yemen, Pakistan. You can see it everywhere because here intelligence services take over military tasks. Okay, but then we have three aspects that we can hand on to Mr. Dombrovsky. One thing is what we tried to sound out just before. Is the use of drones legitimate in a certain area in terms of international law? Second, does the technology lead to certain trigger happiness? And third, what about, well, I would uh, talk about the NATO and the United Nations here, but maybe let's stay with the first two questions. Mr. Dombrovsky, would you maybe answer these first two questions? Embarrassed at my distinguished colleagues on getting the questions, um, but since it was directed at me, I, I will. Um, I think you mistook my reluctance uh, to speak very clearly uh, for dipl- diplomacy, when actually it's a question of the the nature of being a scholar and a researcher and an analyst, and the nature of the questions that are addressed and the presuppositions worthy of further. Uh, uh, delving into. Uh, And so, you know, when I'm asked a question that's leading or that presupposes a set of facts that I don't believe are on the table, I want to be very careful not to uh, make a misstatement of my own factually or logically. So I'm a little bit reluctant in my responses, not because I'm speaking as a diplomat or as a member of the U.S. government, because I don't want to overstep the boundaries of what I think is understood generally on the panel and amongst the audience. So I'm trying to be quite careful. Um, now, uh, you know, the only thing I'll say about this, the hunted and the hunter and all this sort of thing is, 
you know, what brought us to this point? I mean, this didn't occur out of the blue. This isn't something that happened uh, uh, magically. Uh, the Taliban played host to al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda conducted a series of attacks on the United States and many other countries, I'm sure of people in this audience. Uh, a lot of people were killed. Now, whether we went about the effort to stop the Taliban the correct way or not is an interesting strategic question. Whether some of the techniques we've used, like drone strikes, actually create more terrorists than it solved is a very interesting question. But the fact of the matter that, that uh, the reason that the United States and ISAF and some of our NATO allies is in Afghanistan is because they, the, the, the al-Qaeda, with the hosting of the Taliban, undertook some truly horrific acts, not just acts of war against soldiers or law enforcement or government officials, but against innocent civilians. And that's the reason we're there. Now, we can argue about how well that war has been handled. We can argue about the actual activities of it. And I think there's really interesting comments to be had about that. But the, the fact is, this is not a case where the United States or any other country was seeking to engage in this activity in this far-off land. I think it was something that's very unfortunate for society and for the globe. Darf ich Sie da aber noch mal nach Ihrer persönlichen Einschätzung fragen? Denn es ist ja Can I ask you about your personal assessment? I mean, it's an important question. The use of specific technological tools in a war situation. I mean, to your mind, has the drone war in Pakistan led to political damage in a way that the use of a new technology that can protect soldiers' lives might potentially, carefully speaking, not be very smart um, regardless of all the international law breaches? I mean, is the political damage so big that we should rather leave it in Afghanistan, Mr. Dombrovsky? I actually think that drone strikes have been counterproductive in many uh, respects, particularly those that take place in Pakistan and Yemen and some other parts of the world. I can understand the motivations of the decision makers that have to take these. My own assessment, if I was king for a day, so to speak, would be uh, we would greatly reduce the number of such strikes because in the long-term strategic sense, it doesn't benefit the American position or the position of the United States and its coalition partners and allies. So, I, so I, I, I don't think drone strikes are the ideal uh, tool for any of this, and I think they, they, we are certainly reaching the, what, what they say is, uh, economists say is diminishing returns uh, mm -hmm. on this sort of activity. Thank you. Eine Frage nehmen wir hier noch in dieser Runde. One more question to be taken up for the panel, and then I'm going to enlarge the panel. I'm from the Foundation for Science and Politics. I have a remark um, on the reducing of the threshold of war, and I would like to address Mr. Omid Nuripur. My first remark is that there is a misleading aspect. It is wrong to believe that targeted killing of terrorists had something to do with a real war, even if it's always called the war on terror. It's about an intelligence operation to... Um, eliminate some individuals in a targeted way. This is not a war, and these things are going on outside the military mostly. In the past, they were done with cruise missiles, with um, uh, fighter planes, with special forces, with agents, and it's not relevant whether they use drones or explosive or what have you now. So the international law issue is existent anyway. Second, uh, when it comes to the capacity to wage war, we must make a mistake. And I really agree with Peter Dombrovsky. We must make the mistake to confuse one single system with strategic capacities to wage war. This is just an amount, a um, multitude of available systems, reconnaissance options, instruments, tools. So we needn't go into detail here. It's something else. So a tactical means that is improved and enhanced will not replace this ability to wage war. And when it comes to individual tactical cases, they're going to diminish risks, but they're not going to diminish the risks of war. And against this backdrop, I'd like to make the third remark uh, directed to you, Mr. Nori Paul. When it comes to decisions on war and peace, we deal with different political cultures. In Germany, we're not aware of any CIA that can wage war on its own. We don't have that culture. It'd be anti-constitutional. And we have a parliamentary army, and the decision about war or peace is made in parliament. And now I'm wondering that you, as an MP, you're saying that you're afraid of the reducing of the war threshold because it's you that decide upon it. I mean, is it easier for you to decide for war now that there are drones, or would you say no? I mean, 
I am aware of the overall risk, uh, the advantages and drawbacks that I have to ponder uh, from alliance policy uh, up until uh, the fight against terror and the stabilization of a country and the risks for one's own soldiers. And against this backdrop, I'm going to make a reasonable and decent political decision, as the Greens have often done, in one case without the mandate of the UN Security Council, so the reserve of parliament would then apply. And I personally doubt, but actually you should have, you should answer this, I doubt that a parliamentarian would go for war more easily because now he has a drone available instead, instead of a fighter plane. Amit, Amit, the question went to you. You announced a question. I didn't hear it, though. So the question, I think, was, and, well, if I say that the threshold is decreasing in the political sphere, then this is not an evidence of mistrust vis-a-vis -vis myself. The answer is, if I talk about that, I'm not only talking about Germany, but Germany is a player with has a great role to play in the international field. We have to talk about many different things and facets, not only about the situation in Germany. And there are not so many other countries where you have a reservation on the side of the parliament. But of course, you have individual MPs in their own constituency. If there is a base, they go to a funeral. And then the question was, why did that happen? Was it worth it? for that soldier to lose his life. And in the moment where I can escape from such a terrible situation, it is usually better or easier. But it is not to say that the parliamentary army is something wrong. But we didn't discuss the issue of proliferation. If the Iranians claim that they have uh, shot down a high-track drone and have the code now, this is not really credible, but... It is not to be ruled out for and in the future. So in the very moment where something is happening in the context of proliferation, which is also relevant to Germany, in the very moment where we have those technologies everywhere, it is just a matter of time that more and more countries also get it, also countries that we don't want. I mean, you might know this image of the Taliban drone These are pieces of wood that were glued together, and now the Taliban claims we also have a drone. I mean, it's sort of a joke, but seriously, when it comes to the drone discussion, you must also raise the issue of symbols and the symbolic value of the discussion. I mean, whenever armed drones have been used, this is an immense aspect. Yeah, we are going to talk about proliferation, not only proliferation of weapon systems between different countries or non-governmental actors. Hamas and Hezbollah, for instance, are two groups that own drones because they have launched them already. So we will also talk about proliferation from the military to the civil field here and later at the conference. But before we do so, I would like to ask Dr. Nicholas Schernick and also Professor Noel Sharkey, please join me on stage here. Aha, you're getting your nameplate yourself, thank you. Noel Sharkey is Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the University of Sheffield. Exchange of nameplates. That's nice. You can also leave your jackets somewhere. It is so hot. And this is the Heinrich Bell Foundation. So I think we are a little more relaxed here when it comes to those dress codes. So forget about the jackets, please. It's way too warm and hot. Please take them off. Now, Professor Noel Sharkey, correct me if I'm wrong. This is sort of unfair now, but anyway. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in November last year, Professor Sharkey launched a very important and interesting initiative that tries to shed light on ethical, moral, political benchmarks and guidelines as to what is happening in this technology. And we're not only talking about drones uh, that we associate with those aerial systems, but we are now talking about artificial intelligence. We have heard it in Peter Singer's contribution. The data processing is really, really 
done in a very fast way. And then systems, no matter what they are used for, no matter what they are embedded in, are able to solve more complex topics and issues. I will ask Dr. Niklas Schörne, who is a senior research fellow at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt, and he also wrote a wonderful contribution to the IP. So when we focus on the military aspects, we at the moment have two different possibilities to use unmanned systems. That is men in the loop and men on the loop. Mr. Schoenig, maybe you can just explain to us what the difference is so that we really understand what this is all about. So when we talk about an in-the-loop system, we are talk about a remote control where the drone only fulfills few tasks. Peter Singer explained that earlier. The more autonomy the drone gets, that is, the more processes are implemented by the drone, so, for instance, launching GPS points, and at the same time, there is surveillance by a pilot who checks whether everything is okay, and if something unexpected happens, the pilot interferes. In that situation, we talk about an on-the-loop system. However, if the drone it does without this human controller, then the human being is totally out of the loop. Aha, so that is a system where we would expect that an unmanned system makes independent decisions, right? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, this is basically what it comes down to. It starts automatically, it automatically looks for its targets, decides upon the use of weapons, and then returns automatically. This is the full automation or autonomy of those systems. Now, Noel Sharkey, you are a professor for, of artificial intelligence, so you are a person working exactly on those topics. And you're saying, no matter whether it is robotics, whether it is used for civil purposes or other purposes, Google, for instance, has an unmanned vehicle, 70,000 or 700,000 miles, I, I'm not sure. They send it through the United States. And a puppet, a doll, was actually put on the driver's seat so that the other drivers would not be shocked too much. But when it comes to driving, these are highly complex decisions where you have to step on the brake pedal, accelerate, slow down, etc. Do you see the big leap? And let's come back from the operation uses. Do the, you see this big leap frogging in technology? So in the possibility that systems can really make decisions automatically. So that we have really reached a situation where highly complex decisions in the area of artificial intelligence can really be generated automatically? Is that, uh, it's very... The word decision is a very loaded word in itself and, and it's a word that causes a lot of controversy because the word decision as we use it is one way but in computer science a decision is just a choice point in a program so it's a different kind of decision and something like a Google car isn't quite as complex as you think it's a wonderful piece of technology car driving pretty complex. you might yes but but the Google car doesn't. Uh, it's, it's quite complex, but, and, and it's not true about the doll, by the way. That's a bit of publicity. Uh, to, to use the car with its A-plates in California, you have to have a driver with the hand suspended over the wheel at all times because of accountability and insurance. And, and nobody, no private person has managed to get insurance yet. But why it's, the kind of decisions it's making are, first of all, and this is not widely known either, the Google car or another car has to drive on that road because there may be seasonal shifts with branches and things and map that road exactly visually. So when the car is driving along, the sort of decisions it has to make are white line there, move over a little bit. That's what we call that kind of decision. But a decision in a weapon system is quite different. Sorry, I'm going to wreck this stage in a moment. Uh, it's because it, it's so. It's been it so. Wasn't a drone, it was it's a been so slippery up here. Is why, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying so. Um, but the decision of a, for instance, you already have autonomous weapons. We don't have to get into artificial intelligence too much. And in fact, in in Germany, for instance, you have the NBS Mantis, which is used to shoot down mortar shells. 
Okay. Now, the, the thing that you said that I was involved in is in, in April last year from the House of Commons, uh, and it wasn't my initiative, uh, there was a, a campaign to stop killer robots was launched. And it was the uh, Jürgen Altman's involved and, and Frank over there. Um, it was ICRAC, which is a society I'm involved in, plus the Nobel's Women's Initiative, uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, a lot of major NGOs, so it wasn't quite my initiative. But those weapons are weapons, and I make it very clear, they're called killer robots, but the true definition is weapons that once activated will attack a target, will engage a target and attack it without further human supervision. So the MBS... NBS Mantis falls into that category. However, in negotiating a prohibitive treaty, it may be possible to let that through because there are no people, there's no humanitarian law issues about shooting. What it does is it fires a, a sort of, it's called head technology, and it fires a blast in the sky so that a mortar shell will hit that blast and explode so it won't get your incoming troops. But um, I'll just finish on this. So that's fine. And, and I think that that would, be, that would probably be okay. But if you read what the NBS Mantis can do, because it's working, and this is where, where the automaticity comes in, what it also says it can do, but according to the manufacturer's brief, is that it will also use the trajectory of the mortar shell and its path, its path and its direction to calculate where the assailants are. Now, it doesn't say that it will use that information to fire on the assailants, but that is beginning to get into the idea of targeting humans that I don't like. And it would be very easy for Germany to go down that slippery slope. It would take nothing in the technology. It's there now. You could switch it on. It doesn't need some great advance in, in artificial intelligence. And this is the kind of thing we're worried about. Um, Herr Schaki und dann auch Herr Schörnig, lassen Sie mich das nochmal ein bisschen besser verstehen. Denn, um I would like to better understand that what you have just said. Defense systems, I mean, here we say that they are more or less automated and in a more or less automated way, rockets can be launched that are in a specific trajectory, etc. But now we have reached a situation where we, for instance, say, let's take Afghanistan, a war zone. So let us enter risky territory. Let us take Kunduz, where we have a situation where a truck passes or starts not far away from a headquarter. It stops their activities. And then there's something like human intelligence on the ground, spare it's called. Those were not even drones that did reconnaissance, but these were aircrafts. So based on specific information, the decision is made to attack this truck, which could be used as a weapons carrier in this war situation. So it has to be attacked. That is the decision. However, it turns out later that those were not combatants. Those were civilists that tried to get gas for their truck. And now we are in a situation where we say, okay, we really have a situation where we have no men in the loop. So... Can you imagine a decision-making process or situation in this scenario, and I'm not calling it decisions, but let me call it complex development processes. There's a potential risk. Now a decision needs to be made. This means it's being used. Just to get an overview of the current situation, are we really in a situation where this can happen without human beings based on a self-controlled control center? A simpler scenario, and I don't mind you using the word decision now that I've given the qualification. Okay, I just didn't want people to think that it was something that it wasn't. Um, you could have a much simpler scenario where you have an automated gun that at, a, at a border control that looks at the rate of acceleration of a vehicle. And if the vehicle is rushing at it quickly, it could automatically shoot. So that could be done. Um, but who would be accountable for that? And would a human be able to say that um, actually what has happened is the father who's driving his family has just collapsed from a heart attack and jammed his foot in the accelerator? But would a machine be able to do that? No, it wouldn't. 
Herr Schönig, nochmal an Sie die Frage, damit wir das wirklich in, in, seine, in, in seinen äh, ganz... Well, let me come back to this issue because it comprises many dimensions. The situation that I've just sketched in the context of Kundus, is that really a situation where there is really no man in the loop? So from the very beginning, assessing the information that we have, choice of the means, feedback with the different control chains, implementation... So was everything or is it possible that everything works automatically? Natürlich. Yes, it is possible and feasible. But based on the current routes of engagement, you would of course say that if we had such a system, this would have to contact the base. In the case of Kundus, it is not a time-critical scenario. But you can easily imagine that if this was time-critical, that it would really come down to milliseconds. An unmanned system is hit by a radar ray and has to decide within seconds whether it fights against this radar, turns away, etc. So human intervention can just be too late or come too late. So in certain scenarios that are time critical, it is absolutely feasible that the system makes those decisions automatically and independently. In situations that are less time critical, you would have still human loops, although the system could make the decision automatically. Yeah, I would agree to that. I think the two points that you have just raised have to be highlighted again. So one aspect is time criticality and the other aspect is the data volume that needs to be the data that needs to be processed. Now, in order to protect the honor of soldiers, let me say the following. For an army, for the constru control structure, for the officers, it is, of course, not a nice idea that decisions are made by systems, by machines. No army of the world wants that. It contradicts the socio-cultural reality in armies to a great extent. But there is a certain pressure to act in certain situations. There is a certain pressure to act out of technology. So if we have a drone which is equipped with eight cameras and which observes a situation, maybe it is not just one drone, but various drones, then you have the problem that you do not have enough human beings that can assess the data in real time and make the respective conclusions. So there will be a computer algorithm that does that for them. And this is where the trouble starts, because human beings are then no longer able to understand. Even if they can still make a decision themselves, human beings can no longer understand how the machine makes this preselection and preselects those options. And this is a point where the development of technology pushes human beings into an area that they cannot control anymore. And even if you don't want that, Even if that contradicts the cultural experience within the armed forces, because others do it, because the technology pushes you to do it, there will be a situation where it will be exactly like that. The question is, what do countries do? What or when do policymakers set boundaries? Where would they say, okay, here and no further? My personal red line would be a combination of autonomous decisions, so an unmanned platform with a certain degree of autonomy and the use of weapons. This seems to be a red line combination for me. Peter Dombrovsky, you wanted to add something. Yes, I'm going to regret this, but I'm going to play the devil, devil's advocate here for one minute. Um, I think to go back to Noel's point about decisions, At, at, at some point, would all like good decisions be made in critical situations? And the real question is whether the decision is made by a machine or by a human that the decision is a good one, that it's actually a bad guy that's shot or a weapon that's defeated. If it could be demonstrated that the machine actually made better decisions, whether it's time criticality, the algorithms in question, the volume of data to be processed, Could we agree that you might want the machine in certain circumstances to actually make decisions? Just to give you another example, 
uh, if you have, uh, we all know that war is an emotional, dangerous, horrific business, and that the emotions of the shooter, the person actually firing the weapon, can play a role in that decision. If a machine makes a decision free from the emotions of fear, anger, bloodlust, whatever it is, it might actually wind up you get better decisions that right, result in lower casualties and fewer mistakes. Just as a, just as a, a devil's advocate position. That's no, um, no well, it, it's, it's the big word if comes in here. If Santa Claus existed, I'd probably have come here in my own private jet. And the, the question is, uh, have we got the capacity to develop these systems fully? And we, we don't, what, I don't, what I know is that we don't have evidence at all at the moment within my field whatsoever that we'll be able to get any kind of compliance with international humanitarian law. Discrimination is very low at the moment, very low. Proportionality seems out of the question. Real proportionality, the principle of proportionality requires an experienced commander's judgment, not a machine's judgment. So... Uh, you could say, well, maybe maybe the technology will exist. But even if the technology did exist, there are a lot of moral philosophers at the moment who are saying, you know, it's the... In fact, there's some military people saying it's the ultimate human indignity to have a machine kill kill you, that it's just morally wrong to have machines make the decision. So there's that argument as well. There's also the argument of how far do you want it to go? Do you want to give them strategic power? Do you want them to create you know, untended conflicts. So, so where would you take that? And, and I can't see what, I mean, you're, you're speaking from, from, sorry to say this, but you're speaking from a lack of knowledge of the technology. And some people would say things like, well, we could at least use them alongside soldiers to, to shoot a sniper. Because a sniper has a burst of fire, a, a robot could detect that very quickly, swing round, kill the sniper. But you're fighting an adaptive enemy in unanticipated contexts. You know, a sniper could set off a firework among civilians. The thing will turn around and kill the civilians. What about a goat herd? We're talking about adaptive enemy. We're not talking about a lab experiment here. We're talking about out there with a lot of clever people. The the, uh, Al-Qaeda already have a little book that I've got, a little booklet, giving you the top 20 tips to defeat drones. For instance, having carpets in your car. You know, so... You turn this technology around and it's going to cause problems. Omid, Sie wollten gerne noch und dann doch Niklas Schörnig und dann Peter noch mal da drauf. Okay, so we have quite a few responses here. Yeah, Peter Dombrowski is right by saying that you also have error rates with human beings. The Kunda's example is one of those. It is totally right. Secondly, of course, human beings also make fatal mistakes, especially in wars. And then when it comes to the accountability, the legal accountability of machines, I think that is not too big a problem because fully autonomous systems, there's always a beginning. There's always somebody who activates the program and commissions this attack. And it is retraceable. Yes. And then there's an army. Yes. And then there's also an e-book here in Germany. So... If, so this person can be then held accountable if certain errors have been made by him, also with fully automated systems. However, there's a factor that we have to bear in mind. Speed has been mentioned in a positive sense, but speed also accounts for the negative. A human decision, especially because it is slowed down or slower, can also be corrected by other humans. The speed speed that is used by an automated system, however, I mean, somebody can sit in front of a screen, see that everything is wrong, but he has no chance to do anything because, of course, it takes some time for a human arm to press a red button, and this is just too slow for a fully automated system. But if we turn things around and said that an automated system, well, not a fully automated system, were to create a decision situation that is way cooler in which you're not in a direct situation of war, you're not shot at, you're not in an attack or an assault situation. And for instance, um, that a missile launch base is erected and the person who sees the pictures would then make the decision, then I would say that possibly to play the lawyer of the devil, it's the better decision-making system. It's a cool decision that slows down the decision-making process, and B, it would point to the fact that the slippery slope 
we're at with this technology is not that slippery anymore because in the first place I wouldn't see any reason why this advantage should be given away in decision making which means that armies if they use this technology in a military way don't have an interest in fully automating the system because what you have to add in the thinking of war is the political dimension and possibly this can't be actually born by fully automated system. So the question to Neil Sharkey, what else do you do? Strategic decisions. Well, we just had the debate about the tactical component that um, the tactical component goes along with. So my point that I was making was getting back to the fully autonomous system. I was speaking of fully automated systems because there is a situation where you could say that speed is a benefit and you can't really deny this tactically speaking. But there are other situations in which speed can lead to a disaster because there's no corrective in speed. This is what I was getting at. Mr. Scherning and then Peter Dombrowski. Well, I'd like to support two points. Of course, the question of speed is what we know of high-frequency stock trade um, and brokering because the speed at one point becomes so high that the system can develop into different directions without people being able to interfere and intervene uh, without any damage. And here we're just talking about money. And in other situations, it'd be casualties. This is one thing in terms of acceleration. And the second point was raised by Noel Sharkey. I never met an international lawyer that could give me a clear definition of proportionality in war because he said that law was vague in this respect or soft. And soft international law, well, we've heard about different positions in international law. I don't understand how soft international law can be turned into hard ones and zeros. Nobody could ever explain to me how this was going to work. Let me introduce a third aspect that we just broached briefly, the idea that in many modern military systems, not only for drones, very often civilian components are integrated and we deal with a lot of lines of software codes that cannot be fully tested anymore. So at the end of the day, as of now, we have systems in which we can only partially test the software code or we played around with certain scenarios only. But these systems are, of course, not immune to mistakes and they're not immune to manipulation coming from the outside. And I'm always wondering, when looking at what British scientists did they found a backdoor in an American chip last year that is also used in an American weapon system, and they claim that uh, through using the, this backdoor they could reprogram the chip. But who, at the end of the day, will believe that a mistake in a system actually was a mistake or wasn't actually intended? And how do you want to explain that the highly secured Western systems are more vulnerable than was always claimed uh, whenever manipulations take place. So who will believe that in the international scale? And this point is some, some played down in the debate. Peter Dombrowski, you were going to react to that as well, because just before we wanted to say something. A little bit back in time, but I've been accused of not be, of being a diplomat and now a lack of knowledge. And I, I really can't Being quite a diplomat is not an accusation. <laughs> well, it was, used, it was used as such, by the way. Lack of knowledge uh, was la, an accusation. La, lack, of, lack of knowledge. Um, look, the technology, not for a diplomat. Look, I, I, the, what I would simply encourage you when you think about this is to look at real and existing militaries and how real and existing militaries operate. And the, 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 the science about artificial intelligence and autonomous system is one thing, but the constraints in which the modern military operations are conducted with rules of engagement, with lawyers in the loop, with the president actually watching as the acti activity takes place, depending on the seriousness, are quite different from the sort of Dr. Strangelove scenarios you're suggesting. And, and then there's the question of history, and this is something that, that's been bothering me all along, which is 
you know, we're acting as if all this is somehow new, that drones and autonomous systems are somehow just emerging. And it's very sexy to talk about the United States and what we've done and haven't done and how this is hurting the world. But step back in time a little and think about, let's just say, the strategic relationship between the Soviets and the United States or the existing strategic relationship between the United States and other countries and look at the sort of systems that are engaged in monitoring and warning and firing of those missile systems. Now, it's all well and good to talk about a drone, and it's very, it's a horrific thing for families to lose their lives. But if you want to look more seriously at things that are very dangerous for humanity, the autonomy we've dealt with for pushing 50 years during the Cold War and the post-Cold War period, having to do with nuclear weapon systems, missile defense systems, now, that's a much more interesting and serious thing as opposed to the drones, which I think are important. But if you want to get to autonomous systems and want to look at accidents and misreading of data, it's a much more frightening scenario than anything if you conjured up with a, a shotgun or, or a drone. Ich glaube, das ist was, worauf man sich auch auf well, I think this is something that we can agree on on the panel, which is that the red line is where systems develop that much that they can become autonomous. And now we're talking about systems and we go away, we move away from drones because drones are only tactical means and tools. But we're talking about systems of which we don't know what they look like and how they're used. It can be missile defense systems, but it can be anything else. So the red line would then be at a degree of automation where the man is out of the loop. Is that right? Can I get that right. So this is why the question goes to you, Noel Sharkey, because in that sense you've been active in the past. And the question also goes to Omid Nouripour, if you will. What would have to be political initiatives to be taken? And the question also goes to Dr. Liang. What would have to be political initiatives to curtail a development that I can hardly imagine. So technology could hardly be limited in the past. Once something is there, it's always further developed. So what could be political initiatives that would have to be taken to say, here we have a clearly visible line, and when you cross it, um, there will be sanctions. Let me st start with you, Noel Sharkey. One thing first, which is that um, let me admit to my lack of knowledge with, with respect to you in terms of military affairs. I'm not so good at that. And one of the things about this panel is the whole framing is in terms of military. So we've been talking about speed and the speed of war. And one of the big things why we need to automate further, why we need autonomous systems, why we need autonomous weapons is because, you know, war is getting too fast for humans. So the response to that is let's make it even faster. Um, and I don't know what the big rush is to kill people. Why don't we just slow down and make it human-like human, human -like again? I mean, you can talk all you want about the Soviets and us and them, but, you know, I'm not a military person. I'm a, I am actually a citizen of two countries, in fact. And uh, as a citizen, as a normal citizen, I really protest against this continuous development of killing technologies, of, you know, creating a factory of war, a factory of slaughter, and it's disgraceful, really. And I'm sitting here listening to it and discussing it like intelligent people, and I feel quite emotional about it because I think it's terrible. I think it's terrible the world we're moving into. But how can we stop it, and where do we draw the line? Well, the line is, is, needs to be negotiated. First, the first thing to do, Christoph Haynes called for, uh, on the 30th of May, 29th of May, Christoph Haynes delivered a report to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations asking for a total moratorium uh, on all lethal autonomous robots. And that, uh, apart from, we got, we got some chitter-chatter going, but he managed to get 24 states to the table to discuss it. So that was the first step. And the only country that opposed it was one of my countries, the UK, and they opposed the moratorium. The United States wasn't there, uh, but Britain did it for them. And they've, they said they've got their own restrictive prohibitive ban themselves, but they won't go with an international moratorium. But the big, the big thing, once you get 
people sitting down at the table, then you need to discuss. Because obviously, um, if a weapon is fully supervised, and I mean, when I say fully supervised, I mean you've got complete cognitive, you know, active involvement with the thing and the target is visually there. That's the one side. The other side is complete robot automation where it's going out, searching everywhere, finding its own targets, finding signature strikes and killing them. But there's a lot of steps in the middle. There's the on-the-loop step in the middle, which is you know some one person in control of a swarm of robots. But there's also the idea of just having time to veto, like in the Patriot system that shot down the British tornado in the Iraq war. So is that right to veto? There's a, a series of levels of humans in control. And then we've got the other weapons we talked about, like the Mantis and various weapons. I mean, the military don't want to give up these toys because they're very useful for missiles coming in, but you need to get them to sit down and have exceptions to the rule. Generally speaking, I'm, I'm talking English because the question sometimes... Um, generally speaking, it would be about a clear definition about when exactly we could speak about men out of the loop, a completely automated system, and then a political initiative in the form of a moratorium, which probably is very difficult to achieve because countries who do have the systems do not like to give it up, um, to say that's the limit, we don't want to go further. No, I think the current systems are probably going to be okay, most of them, the vast majority. So this is a preemptive moratorium, a preemptive ban, to, mm -hmm. to a collective pause so that we can think about where we're going with this. And... The definitions, we're putting together definitions all the time, of course, but it's up to nations to sit down with these definitions and make that decision. We can't make it for them. We can push them as hard as we can, but we can't make that decision for Dr. them. Dr. Liang, this is doch mal eine Frage, die ich gerne an Sie... Dr. Liang, this is a question that I'd like to pose to you, because China is a country of which we know exactly that... By now, it plays a very important role, and it will continue to play that role even more intensely so. So as you said, technology is maybe not at the point where it should be, but I'd be surprised if it didn't move in that direction. Where would you draw the line, and where would you say this is what we have to negotiate about in order or before we can use automated systems? Uh, I don't want to use the words uh, they talk about the efficiency or speed used the uh, high technologies because uh, last in last century we, we invented the nuclear weapons no matter you call it uh, right or wrong no matter you call it uh, good or bad but actually we have uh, the mad system the mutual short destroy system we avoid uh, big wars but in this century we invented new uh, dimension of wars, the high-tech drone and the cyber attack, something like this, and it makes it very easy to launch a war. And uh, so you call it efficiency, and you call it, uh, how to say, uh, to avoid the low carity. But uh, tell you, the high carity is a way for people to avoid a war, to, to, to fight a war. So we this is a drive for people to find a way to avoid the war. And uh, if you use these high techs, maybe you open a Pandora box, and uh, other countries or other people who feel oppressed, uh, feel hatred, when they cannot fight you on this ground, they will find another way and restrict the war to against you. Maybe just like what happened in Boston and in UK or London. And uh, they kill person randomly. You cannot uh, kill those people by drone. And uh, so, personally, I think it's not a good idea to use these weapons to kill people, especially to uh, leave the decision making to the machine. And the, the machine, you use the machine, you can highly improve the efficient, but the e efficient is on killing people. Omid Nouripour, ein Wort zur Politik. Omid Nouripour, one word on the political dimension of this problem. Where do you have to draw the line? Well, the first problem is that we cannot limit, limit the problem. Well, 
if we stuck to robotization, be easier. But this is not the problem. Um, in the face of military scenarios and new technologies, it's different. And in this horrific scenario and enumeration that was man made by Peter Singer, some dimensions were missing. To, for instance, outer space, rod from God, the silicon bar that is thrown out of space and that can have an effect uh, like a small nuclear bomb. Uh, and meanwhile, this is something feasible for many non-nuclear states. And if you consider the interfaces between nanotechnologies and automation and robotics, then the scenarios become innumerable. So today, it's relatively easy. It's not impossible for DIY uh, geeks to go into a store and to build an explosive and to... Um, go to the Capitol Hill and look at who comes out and who to strike. So uh, this, has got, this has got huge implications. So limitation is the problem. But in the face of what we know of, for instance, that space should not be military space and the question that neuro res research uh, has to be banned, or brain research has to be banned for military purposes. But there are states that um, probe on chips in the brains of fighter pilots uh, to make them re react more Swiftly, this is not science fiction. This is ethically unacceptable. But getting back to robotics, except from some exceptions that can be regulated, automated systems and autonomous systems should be banned. There can be exceptions, for instance, in post-conflict situations where a sea route is just uh, where you find many mines there, and then uh, robotic systems might be used that go in there autonomously to do away with mines. But these are exceptions. As a rule, the situation or the scenario without people controlling things is crossing the red line. And yesterday we heard from the President of the United States that he said we needed to um, establish rules as to how we deal with drones. And I thought it was right of him to say so. But to start with, we would have to say that strike drones are a military system, but which means that intelligence services should no longer use them. I would now open the round once more. I had one first question here. Where's the microphone? Here it comes. On the right side, in the middle, I can see your hands. Yes, leave it there, and we're going to go to you next. Please be concise and accurate and address one panelist. My name is Thomas Nels. I'm a journalist. I have difficulties with that uh, calming, soothing pill of trusting democratic system, Mr. Dombrovsky. And to my knowledge, most explosives are launched by democratic states such as the United States and Israel. So how can you say that against this backdrop when trusting into democratic systems? I mean, I'm a journalist, and I'm exploring context, and uh, often people respond to me that everything has to be kept confidential, and I don't get any information. And I mean, it's similar like as in Belarus and in Iran, where I get no information either, and the same thing goes for Israel and the United States. And the second question, which is more provocative maybe to Mr. Dicko, what about the ethical, operative, and technological difference between all these strike drones and their options? And uh, on the other hand, the explosive that a Taliban puts somewhere, controls remotely in order to kill somebody in a targeted way, and collateral damage is tolerated here. Doesn't killing become an end in itself here? First question. Please. I'm not sure there was a question, but I, uh, the first thing I'll say is if, if you can't distinguish between the Belarus and Israel and the United States, I'm, I'm not really sure what to say about that. There are differences in, in these societies. Um, the, the second point, which is much more serious, is that um, look, I mean, there's an old joke, and I can't remember who said it, which is democracy is the, the worst of all systems except for everything else. And, and you know, I would like to think that war could be eliminated. I'm a believer in arms control. I'm a believer in disarmament. I'm a believer in negotiations to end and, and to avoid war. Uh, unfortunately, there are times in war, uh, at least in history as I've read it, uh, war comes uh, is something that happens. 
and it's very unfortunate. Uh, the serious question for me is how we as democratic societies can have debates like this and then make some limits and make some choices about the particular systems we choose to build and not build and then how we choose to use those systems. I would submit to you that at least in Israel and the United States for two of the cases you've named, you at least have a greater chance of this democratic de debate having real impact upon the actual operations of the militaries that are entrusted with these systems than you would in some other societies we might think of. And I would hope that you would see the difference and work together with me to think about how we put those limits on. And like you, uh, I'm very frustrated. I share uh, our, our journalist friend in the front who raised the question of transparency and openness. I'm a big believer in transparency and openness. So I hope that when you ask your questions of your government or my government, you get better answers than you apparently have so far. Herr Dicko, wollen Sie die zweite Frage kurz aufnehmen? Mr. Dicko, would you like to answer the second question? Just a side remark for a start. We have to differentiate between the wars we want to wage and the wars that are imposed on us. And my feeling is that in the past 20 years, the West waged wars that the West wanted to wage, and here we have to wonder what are the means that are available. Now getting to the war on terror, and I think here there is one basic difference and fundamental difference between Germany and the United States. The fact that the United States declared war on terror is not just um, matter of pronouncing something, but it's got legal implications. This war without borders means that you can use military means everywhere at any time, which would not work in Germany. In Germany, terrorism is fought against by the police. So the police has a mandate inside of Germany and not outside of Germany. So it's unimaginable. It's Well, it's unimaginable that there are targeted killings in any way, uh, the exception being the final rescue shoot shot. And um, I mean, the, but there are some uh, specific requirements to that. So who has the right to kill somebody and how? Here I'd answer that crime is to be prosecuted with the means of the rule of law and terrorism is crime, which means that you need to arrest terrorists first. And it's only when they withdraw from that detention by way of force and because people and, and when people are threatened, then they can defend themselves. Just to clarify the Taliban question in Afghanistan, we are in a different situation because there there is a mandate by the United Nations, a mandate for war that authorizes our German army to kill fighters and combatants with the exception of civilians, of course, with the exception of, and I hate the word, collateral damage, so the unintentional killing of civilians. But there is also a clear mandate to fight and kill that applies to the Taliban that can are considered to be combatants. Nobody. Yes, that is true. But the task of the United Nations and the reasoning behind the ISAF mandate is to make sure that uh, there is support for the Afghan government and that there is protection of the civil society. Military means are allowed within the context of that mandate, but it's not an end in itself. It comes down to the stabilization of Afghanistan and it comes to the establishment of Afghan military forces and security forces. Of course, there is a right of self-defense, but I think we have to distinguish between fighting against terror, fighting against insurgents. One of the big problems was that the Afghan population couldn't distinguish between ISAF operations and enduring freedom operations for a long time. So what is hunt of terrorists and what is stabilization of the country? And this, at the end of the day, reflects the problem. The German approach, and I think it is the right one, is to fight against terrorists with means of democracy and rule of law. Okay. There was another question over there. Bayer from the construction and traffic industry. Mr. Sharkey, you talked about an example which makes 
me pose a question to Mr. Dombrovsky. In the context of the Google vehicle, you talked about the Californian traffic rules so that those rules say that unmanned vehicles are prohibited in the state of California. Maybe it would be possible if, or maybe it would be good to have a liability insurance, an insurance that takes over the risk here. And it was interesting to find out that Mr. Dombrovsky attended the legal committee and the director of the federal police forces. When it comes to issues of insuring cars in California, this is not our topic. No, no, no. I had a different question. So here's my question. Drones are used domestically. And if drones are used in the United States, and if there is the accusation of a senator that there is no legal basis for that, who assumes liability? How do you deal with the problem of liability and accountability? If a drone is used within the U.S. or by the U.S., rather without any legal basis, sorry, sorry, what liability and accountability and what for? Well, if an accident happens, if a drone is used abroad, a drone is not used within the U.S., I mean, at least not armed drones. It could be possible, couldn't it? No. Okay, I'm going to withdraw my question, but I wanted to pose it as a consequence of the different contributions made by the panelists, especially by Peter Singer, that it might be possible in the future. Yes, you will hear a lot about proliferation of drones in the coming days. We haven't even covered the cyber area yet, but use the coffee break now before the next session and between, before Mr. Munkler's keynote speech. We would like to thank all panelists for their contributions and thank you for your questions.